All right, guys, thanks for coming out for Offshore Night. Um, tonight we've got Captain Max Despoto. Uh, Max got to start kind of fishing striped bass here uh, in New England and quickly established himself as a great tuna fisherman as well uh, on the Cape, midshore and offshore here. Um, he's a young member of the Shimano Pro staff, which is pretty impressive, and, uh, and fishes right now with East Coast Charters. Um, so you can always look him up at East Coast Charters online. And uh, we'll let Max take it away. Awesome. Thanks Thank you, coming. Eric. Thank you guys all for coming. A little more on my background. I Like Eric said, same thing. Striper fishing Black Island growing up since forever ago, basically since I could remember. And then slowly getting into offshore thing. I saw my friends doing it. Some people I knew doing it. Had to be a part of it. Went to the Cape. We got two that day on top water. And after that, everything else is over. Not that I still don't love going to block and catching stripers and doing all the inshore stuff, but I was hooked. And then from there, just slowly progressed into, as our bite in Rhode Island progressed, got it more into that. And then trolling the conventional game, the canyons, deep drop sword fishing, and it's never ending. So, and here we are today. For tonight, First, I want to talk about, well, first we're going to be focusing on that midshore bite that's been so consistent and accessible for us, basically from behind the island to the shipping lanes. And then first I want to talk about safety. When I talk about it with people, they're always like, do you think I'll be good running this boat to here? And it's always a depends answer every time. Basically everything for offshore depends, but that's, I just want to go over some basics for that. And then after that, gear prep and rigging, and then just on the water, what to do, when, what's the right answer, and what we see throughout the season. And if you guys have any questions about what I'm talking about, just specific stuff, if it's confusing, just stop me. I'll go over it. And then at the end, we can go over big conceptual stuff if you guys have anything on that. Um, just the area. When I say midshore, that's what I, it's burned in my head. Guys will call it offshore, inshore. North of this, this is roughly the shipping lanes, this line here. So anything north of that, anything south of that is offshore canyons in my head. So dump, butterfish hole, Coimbra, all the way out to the star, and then inside to the gully, any, that area. It's really what I'm focusing on. And then safety. So my, Judgment is different from someone else's. I'm not telling people to do something or not to do something, but just from what I've seen out there, I've come up with basic fundamental yes and no's. I've seen fires, center consoles burning down out there. Last year we had that accident in the fog, two boats that had radar, working radar, hit each other. And then coming in from the canyons the year before, commercial boat, not their fault at all, drive shaft popped out, they sunk. Got in their life raft, Coast Guard came with a helicopter, picked them up. So good days, besides the fog day, all were perfectly blue sunny days, flat calm, no wind, nothing bad could happen, something happened. So the three things, if someone asks me, hey, I have this boat, can I go for it? The first thing I always say, does it have radar? I think fog is our biggest danger, if you want to call it a danger, our biggest obstacle, say. And it could be looking like this here, it could be looking like that 20 miles out, and then you hit a fog bank. And you can't move if you don't have radar. And having trust in that, knowing how to use it. If you don't have radar, if someone asks you, hey, what do you think, should I go for it? If they don't have radar, I, I advise not to, obviously. I'm not saying, can't say no, you not, can't stop them from going, but just logic. Uh, a VHF, having a radio, the sat phone, the Garmin inReach are great, but if you don't know who that one commercial boat is away from you and you're in trouble, being able to reach them and make sure the VHF works before you go, um, that's, that's huge. And then just a basic first aid kit. Just You cut yourself with a knife, you get a hook in you, just something stupid can happen and having that just to help you get back to land until then. And then extras, the basics, what I think everyone should have if you're gonna be doing it regularly. Garmin inReach has been a huge, huge help just not just for safety, but communicating between guys on the water. If they're out of radio distance or if you don't want to say stuff on the water, this is awesome. And then it has the SOS feature and you could get people on land. Just if storms are coming, I've had people text me, hey, 
that thunderstorms are popping up, get in or watch out. Um, commercial flare kit is, I think, a really good idea to have. It has big parachute flares, just different than your normal little gun that is uh, required for recreational. It's great to have. It lasts, I think, f three or five years. They expire, so buy it once, forget about it, have it, and then buy it again once it expires. An EPIRB, just if something goes bad, another, this has the SOS feature, but one more backup, able to find you if something goes bad. Life raft, they take up a lot of space, so smaller center consoles, my boat including. It was hard to find storage, justify the storage for it, but after seeing everything happen, it's a no-brainer now to have it, and legally for the licenses I have, I have to have it. And then a sat phone. Sat phones are getting less popular, say, with the introduction of inReach, but it definitely does have its perks. Um, coming in from the canyons two years ago, when my motors just cut out, stopped working, and my first instinct was text my mechanic. My friend luckily had his sat phone. I didn't have one at the time, and I was able to get him on the phone. He was able to walk me through everything, and being able to do that versus just texting was huge help. So that kind of opened my eyes and went and got a sat phone. So just some things to keep in mind, and these, this isn't cut and dry, obviously. People have seen a ton more than me, so just from my experiences, that's what I base it off of. And into the fishing. We need to, which E, hmm, it's always hard to go. I say we have four good months, and then out of those four months, each week, we maybe get, if we're lucky in the best summer week, we get four days to fish, three days to fish, realistically two days to fish. So making each one of those count. And by doing that, it starts off the water controlling the things that could go wrong in your favor, gear prep, making sure all your leaders are good, making sure all your line is good, making sure all your knots are good, not reusing something for the 10th trip in a row, putting fresh on, just doing that little extra effort because season comes to an end before we know it. And if something fails for that, if it's a tough day, you only get that one shot and something fails and you're gonna regret it. And it could be overwhelming looking at everything. So I'm gonna try to break down things into each category, top water, break that down into what you need, jigs. What do I need here? Rods, reels, do I really need this? And before a couple of years ago, we would have this kind of seminar just as a jig and pop seminar. because that's what people wanna do. It's the most sporty, it's the most fun. But with, the, with how the fishing has been over the past couple of seasons, you really need to cover the jig and pop and the conventional side of things, trolling and chunking, and live bait fishing on top of it. So it's not the most fun all the time, but to be effective and to make the trips actually worth it, having that trolling trolling stuff or the chunking stuff, even if it's your backup plan, you, it just makes sense to do it now. There's really no one who is just strictly jig and pop. There's really no one that's just trolling guys. Everyone has to be a mix now and cover all grounds. And just looking at it, we'll start on the jig and pop side, looking at it from a basic, what's the difference between a jigging and casting setup? The obvious is putting the rods next to each other, seeing the length of the rods, casting way longer. This is, and the question always is, is there a hybrid? Yes and no, there's, but it's really two separate setups, having your jigging setups and having your casting setups. The one hybrid that I would say is you could fish a Ronzi on a popping rod and drop it to the bottom. You could fish that, you don't have to actively jig it, you could just dead stick it. That's what I would consider the hybrid, but to actually jig and be effective at it and having your casting setups and being effective at that, two totally different setups. The jigging rod is short because to put it in outside of fishing terms, you're, well, while fishing, you're flipping the jig constantly working it up, working it up, working it up, and having a weight at the end of a stick, if you were to have it on this short rod, it's gonna feel a lot lighter. Versus if you have it eight feet away from you, that same weight is gonna feel a lot heavier and fatigue you out way quicker. And you're gonna get burnt out even working it on this short, on this short rod, but it's gonna be a lot more efficient versus if you had to do it on the long popping rod. 
popping rod, length really comes in with casting distance. Being able to cover that ground, to make long casts cover ground, if a lot of the times for top water, the fish will be showing, but if they aren't, if you're just blind casting around, being able to cover ground to where they could be instead of where you know exactly they are makes a difference. Sometimes it'll be right on that first sweep, a fish will come up, eat it, and then sometimes it's right next to the boat. Covering that ground lets the fish see it. Question on the reels. Yeah. You know, they got all these different, you know, gears, the high gear, the power gear. Yep. Um, are you comfortable s switching a, a, a reel between a, a jigging rod and a, and a casting rod, or, or, do you, or do you think that retrieve speed is that critical to? You could, you could do it. I, that's not something that I'm cut on dry, and no, you can't do it. I prefer, I prefer high speed for popping, for casting. I like that because the biggest benefit I see from that is if I if fish are up on the surface, I cast to them, they go down, and if they pop up 90 degrees away from me, I wanna be able to burn that in as fast as possible and get it to them before they go down and pop up over there. So that high speed for popping, I find great. Jigging for focusing on the rec fish, the rec bluefin and the yellowfin, I can go either with a slower gear ratio reel or the high speed, really either. Once you get the cadence down with one reel, you'll be used to it. I'm fine if I'm jigging with a, say a 20,000 size reel, those are tend to be slower gear ratio reels. And then the 14,000 is the fastest. Whichever one I'm using, I'll get used to the cadence and it'll work either way. Um, if I were to say, I would go with fast on both before I went on slow on both, if that makes sense. And that's, that's why. And so getting into the jigging setups, two different ways to go, spinning and conventional, really just comes down to preference. I, if you get used to both, you can do both. I find having both ready and getting used to both is great because if I'm jigging all day with this, going up, going up, it's all lifting with my right hand and reeling with my left hand. And then I get burnt out, I get switched to this, lifting with my left hand, reeling with my right hand. So it gives me like a total breather, a total reset basically. And then I just go back and forth, back and forth. Now going with spinning versus conventional, do you find that there's a different um, pattern to the flutter of when your jig's dropping? Because when you do, when you lift the bale, mm -hmm. you have a delay with the wrap. Yes. Coming off the spinning reel. Yeah. Now you open free spool on the Osea, it's a direct line to, right. you can't almost, you basically can't free spool that, you gotta thumb it you're gonna get a nest, whatever. Yeah. Do you think the, the action of the jig is much different from spinning to the conventional? While falling, whenever I drop a jig, jigs are made to catch water when they're being dropped, so mm -hmm. it, you get that fluttering action. Mm -hmm. When I'm dropping from the surface starting out to get to the bottom, I always either knock it a little bit or hold a little tension to get it to go, to get it to fall straight. Yeah. Yes, and I'm. I feel. Same thing with spinning. I feel like it comes off smooth enough. It might hold it up a little bit, but if I knock it good right in the beginning, it holds straight okay. to go down. But if you don't knock it, then yes, it's in, coming off of the spinning reel, fluttering like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's gonna catch water basically the whole time. And it does. It scopes out on you. Yes, right. If you give it a good knock and if it's cut into your spool a little bit and slows it up, then you might see that more. Mm -hmm. But most of the time with I'm gonna get into this, but 170 to 210 ish gram jigs, mm -hmm. it's I get away with it with spinning rods. So you don't hold the line with the spinning rod, or you do? Um, I'm trying to think. No, I, mo I'm, I mainly just let it let it, let it fly. Out. Yeah, yep. Knock it at first. Hold it. Hold it. Knock it. Get it. Get it from this to this. And then let it go. Yes, gotcha. exactly. So the two main setups that I go with for this midshore ground is a 10 or 14,000 size reel on a heavy or extra heavy rod. This, the 10 and 14 are, you can get away with smaller than that, but I consider a safe minimum, safe minimum to go with for reel size. It has the drag and it has the line capacity. Any smaller than that, you could start running into the line capacity and a little bit of a drag issue lifting the fish. But for the most part, 10 and 14 is gonna have you all set on all the fish that you're gonna be able to keep and catch. If you hook a giant, 
bluefin, they've been mixed in over the years, you have bigger problems. But a heavy in and extra heavy are the ones that I go with. The two models, the two different models for rods that I use, they're both Shimano, is the Grappler and the Game Type J. Both have similar bl blank construction, and this goes across all Shimano rods, the Spiral X and High Power X. If you're unfamiliar with that, what those are, it sets them apart from traditional glass blanks or graphite blanks. Traditional glass and graphite blanks don't have any reinforcement on the outside or inside, and they're stuck to what the mold comes out with. What the blank is, it is. With Spiral X and High Power X, Shimano is able to reinforce and tweak the blank to exactly how they want it. Spiral X is a carbon tape wrapped in certain patterns, an X pattern in the inside of the blank. The biggest benefit that you'll see as an angler to this is they're able to pick where the lifting point of the rod is. If you see people lifting big heavy weights or fighting a heavy fish with a rod and it goes all the way through to the reel seat, that rod has lost its power. There's no more lifting in it. That fish is beating you. It's, it, could, it won't break, some of them won't break bending that much, but you, aren't, you have no advantage over that fish. Being able to put the lifting point into the rod instead of just having it go all the way through and not lifting, you have power. And it prevents ovalization of the blank. That is what causes blanks to shatter or break. That when it gets into such an arc, the circle on the inside of the blank crushes, crushes, crushes into an oval, and eventually it fails. And then High Power X is a similar concept on the outside of the blank. And this is what we see as an angler for this is it, depending on the pitch that they wrap the tape at, it, normal X is at 45s versus a tighter pitch, wider pitch, it creates a specific action of the rod. So they could have the same blank, have, be two completely different rods to, the, to an angler. So for a jigging rod, say you want a softer tip and then backbone to, to flip the jig, they could put that right into the jigging rod. For heavier, so that's for the 14,000 and the heavy and extra heavy are what I'm running probably 75% of the time in this area for the yellowfin and bluefin. And then if there's bigger bluefin mixed in or I'm targeting, basically if I go to the Cape and there's big bluefin there or if the 65, 60 plus inch bluefin are there, that's when I'll go up to the 20,000 size and the extra heavy or extra, extra heavy. So if I were to get, just getting into it, I'd get the 14,000 size with the heavy, have that as it's lightweight, you can jig it all day, it's fun. And then if I were to get a second one, I would go up to that heavier for the bigger fish. And line for that 65 pound is all you'll need. It's the thinner diameter compared to 80 pound or even some guys will go with 100 pounds. Um, the scope's in the water, like you were saying scope. The thicker braid catches the water more and makes it harder to work the jig, you'll have to reset more. Thinner braid helps with that. That's for the 14,000s and then for the 18, for the 20,000 size reels, that's when I'll go up to 80. And really won't go heavier than 80 for jigging. What do you put on the Yosha trigger? 80. 80. For the 4,000, yes, 80 pounds. And then um, the leader for jigging, one advantage over other people that you can get compared to if you're just doing a 10 or six foot leader, 12 foot leader, like a popping setup, go with a 20 or 25 foot leader. You're working the jig vertically through the water column. So if a fish is up high, it's gonna run into the braid a lot easier before it sees the jig. So separate the jig from the braid. I'll start off with, I may even go to 30, if I'm tying a fresh FG knot and I'm going with a new leader, I'll start it off at 30 feet. By the time I cut it down, cut it down, cut it down, I'll restart when it gets to 20 feet. Having that extra leader saves me on some days. Fishing right next to someone with even a 20 or 15 foot leader versus a 30 foot on days where they're finicky, it, uh, it helps a lot. Are you rocking like a 65? For, 65 liter. Uh, pound, pound wise? Yeah. Uh, I, so 80 is standard for me. I start almost every day off with 80. I think bite wise, 80 is right in the middle of, if they're finicky, they'll eat it, but if there's bigger fish, you won't chafe them off that good. You won't chafe them off as easily. So I always start off with most of the time, always start off with 80, and then if the yellowfin come in, they get, they get finicky, I'll drop down to 60, 50, even 40 sometimes. And then if there's bigger bluefin mix in, jump up to 100 if the fish aren't that line shy. 
and then two separate categories, plastics and jigs for jigging. Ronzi, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. It's a staple. I really won't leave the dock without one tied on in some way if I'm going um, casting top water, the paddle tail or the straight tail on it, on a casting rod, and then I'll always go with one jigging. And then for jigs, keep it simple. Oh, I do a wide profile jig and a slender profile jig. There's a ton of different jigs. It can be like mind boggling looking at them all, but break it down into that. Slender profile, wide profile. If one day you're jigging the slender profile and the Ronzi is getting eaten a lot next to this, switch to the wide profile. It'll uh, resemble the Ronzi more than the slender profile. And sometimes that'll work. Some days they only want the Ronzi, can't touch metal. Sometimes it's just so slow with the Ronzi, everything is less is more with the Ronzi. That stick it, just slowly work it off the bottom. That's what they want some days. And then some days they want the slender jig moving fast, ripping it up through the water column. So each day is different. Every day that I leave the dock, I'll have, for each person, I'll have one with metal, one with plastic. Just, all right, you start with metal, you start with plastic, you start with metal, you start with plastic, and see what the day is. It's day to day. And if one's doing good, switch it. I, if one's, and then uh, color-wise for Ronzi, I keep that simple too. White, pink, and sand eel. These are really the only three that I'll carry for the most part. This covers your natural colors. This covers, for some reason they like pink squid. If squid is around, that's, that's a simple explanation, but I can't explain the other times why they like pink, and then this is a sand eel, another natural color. Do you find you use one on a cloudy day versus a sunny day more? Just when I think I figure that out, I'll get a cloudy day that the sunny color works the best, and then a a sunny day that the cloudy it's it, I can never actually pattern that but I like I said I'll start off with a white and a pink on and then throw in a sand eel if those aren't working so just just playing around but three colors a Ronzi a wide profile jig and a slender profile jig three things that's yes yep for jigging I like the heavier head and this still even scopes out sometimes I'm not sure if you guys have found it and the heat actually started making the, this is a tin head. He started making them in lead this year over the winter. So now he'll be selling these in lead, which will give it another, I forget exactly, but maybe like another ounce or ounce and a half. Um, I haven't used those, but I know people that have, and they've, they've been uh, catching them on it. Yes. Yep. When's he coming out with that? I know he's doing that. Uh, this, this winter he just started it. So hopefully stores, maybe yes. Eric knows better. They should be here for our season. Okay. Yep. So that'll be a huge advantage because days where this is working good, once it scopes out, you're kind of out of luck and restart. Do you ever put weight on it or do anything else to get it down? There are some days where I'll fish it. Um, like on, the, on the live bait route. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll set it up just like I'm fishing a live bait on a down rod. Yeah. I'll put the sinker, I'll put it way far away from it, like yeah. 20, 30, even 40 feet and fish it as a big three-way basically. Put, a, put the weight on a rubber band and get it away from it. And yeah, that, that's definitely worked before. That covers all of our basic jigging and then switching over to casting. Same deal, 10, 14,000 size reel on a medium or medium heavy rod. Grappler 7.7 seven, medium heavy is my go-to. And the eight foot medium is my other go-to. They both uh, cast a mile and have enough lifting power to get those yellow fin and rec blue fin. For bigger fish, like it's just like jigging, I'd start off with the 14 or 10,000 size reel with a medium or medium heavy. That's gonna cover you on most grounds. And then if that was my one. If I had those, I would then buy an 18,000 and go with a extra heavy or heavy model. Cover you on both bases. For the 18,000 size reel, we just, Shimano just came out with the new OSHA plugger big games. The extra heavy is what I would pair that extra uh, with a 18,000 size reel. And that's gonna cover you on the rec blue fin. Still fun for yellow fin, still has enough play in it to be fun for smaller yellow fin and small blue fin, but at the same time have enough power to lift those big blue fin easily. 65 inch blue fin could be hard to lift sometimes and that rod will beat them up good. And then same deal, 65 pound power pro, 80 pound depth, 80 pound power pro. Same across the board for jigging, and then 80 pound fluoro is standard. 
for those. And to break it down lure wise, the jigging had bronzy, wide profile, slender profile. The casting is gonna have paddle tail, stick bait, popper. Have you ever jigged the paddle tails? I haven't. They do fit on the heavy heads and they fit on the same heads. You can slide a paddle tail on this. I do know people that have and have caught them on it. But when jigging, I mainly just stick with, with the straight tail. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you. And I know people have caught them on it, but just a confidence thing, yeah. really. Yeah, what works, works. Yes, exactly. So paddle tail, um, like I said, this the Ron Z paddle tail goes on the same jig head as the straight tail. Works great casting, finicky fish. I'll break down when to throw what, but paddle tail, stick baits, um, two different options, floating, sinking. Uh, if there's big bluefin around, they'll come up for the floating no problem. It'll be awesome to see the strike. It's like a popper strike, but better using a floating stick bait. It's incredible. And then sinking stick bait. This is a hoagie slider, really easy to get, easy to work. It's just a simple lure and sinks good. And when they're finicky or yellow fin and finicky bluefin, the sinking seems to get bites better than a floating. Uh, antidote. Oh, yeah. oh, the cup. Um, this one, I think is sand eel. Sand eel, yes. But yeah, sinking, floating, floating and sinking stick baits, but the main three categories, paddle tail, stick bait, and then popper. Three things that I look for in a popper. Popper seems simple, just make a splash and the fish come up, but one is catching the fish's attention. That's all it is and the reflective pattern on this the flash boost in it and the bubble chamber has a cut up in the cup here um, really been all over this and catching the fish's attention and casting distance this has a weight inside so it always flies to the water parallel with it instead of catching the wind and flying perpendicular it won't cast far like i said covering water with the casting rod this casts a mile and then holding to the water it doesn't fly out of the water when you pop it. If it's a little choppy, swing on it, kicks out of the water, tangles itself, drives you crazy. This, I find, holds the water really good. This is the new Shimano Bomb Dip. They should be in stores, again, for our season. I had samples for them last year, and the yellowfin and bluefin were all over it. But the three basic things that I look for in any popper, there's others in other brands. Mad Mantis is a really popular one. Six and a half and eight inch in the Mad Mantis, the Bomb Dip, three things, casting distance, catching the fish's attention and holding to the water. If it does those three things, it's gonna be good. And then conventional setups. Um, like I said, my background was jig and pop, Cape Cod, and then switching slowly into everything. And at all costs, we would avoid fishing conventionally, trolling or live bait or chunking, just because the big reels on the big heavy stiff rods was no fun. I wanted no part of that. It took the fun totally out of it and well, you, you hook a fish finally after trolling or live bait fishing and no one wanted to fight it. We would all look at the rod and be like, I don't want to pick that thing up and fight it. it seemed more like pain than anything. And the introduction of Talica and lighter, more play rods, these are the Therese Blue Water full roller rods, totally changed my mindset on it. Now I have no discrepancy, I have no hesitation switching to conventional if that's the way to go. These setups are so light and it's with the 25 and the 50. For midshore, I've been sticking more with the 25 just because line capacity, drag, and power is not a problem, especially with these rods now. It's fun. It's just like fighting it on a jigging rod or casting rod. I have no problem switching now. For spooling them up, I do 80 pound hollow core and 80 pound mono. I get about 400 yards of um, 80 pound hollow core and then 100 yard mono top shot, so 500 yards won't be a problem. You, if you run into a problem, it's a big fish and odds are if you can't keep a giant, you won't be able to keep it anyways. But for trolling and chunking and live bait, these have kind of, uh, that's when I'll step up to the 50. I'll do same, same setup, but 100 pound top shot and 100 pound hollow core. This and the full roller rods are nice because it kind of took two separate rods that I have and put them into one. When, I'm not sure if any of you guys got on the chunk bite last fall here, it was incredible. But I was able to take the same rods that I was trolling with and switch to chunking. 
I'll get into more chunking 101, but having the rollers on it instead of just normal ring guides, huge advantage. And after this, I want, if you guys want to come pick these up, bend them, I have a harness. We could put a harness on, fight them. It, it really changed my total mindset on fishing conventionally versus just sticking with jig and pop. What harness do you prefer? Black Magic. Black Magic is, it really takes, you could have a fish on giant bluefin and just like be looking on your phone or looking around and not even feel it. It's, it's incredible. What, they, they put it all in the main parts of your body and it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it is. And then, like I had the three categories for jigging and casting, trolling comes down to the same thing. Tracker bars, I'm sure all of you guys have used them. They really change the game for especially center console guys. Not having to have outriggers, and even if you do have outriggers, getting it wider, like the, the big sporties and the commercial boats have wide beams on top of longer riggers. So this kind of puts us in the same ballpark as them uh, with just normal traditional bars. Trackers are for fishing mid I'll get into the normal spread that I run, but that's the main thing. And then the shoe and Ron Z combo, this is good for bluefin, yellowfin. Sometimes if those aren't getting eaten, if it's a slow day, you just get one random fish to eat this and it saves the day. This is, we're stuck. Yeah, so I'll put this right down the middle, way back. So traditionally, we would fish a ballyhoo under these Joe shoot heads, but having bait every time I go out, if I know I'm not gonna troll is a pain. Putting a Ronzi behind has been working just as good side by side next to bait. Now you have the bait holder on that that you crimped on? Yes, that? yep, exactly. So Ronzi has the, they're made out of lead, I believe. They're just crimps, barbs, basically that you twist on the hook, press it on, and it holds the bait all day. And then slide this over and it's been working great. And then on top of those, if I were to add one other thing to the spread, it would be a deep diver, a Nomad, an X-Wrap, a Bomber makes one. And those are nice because say you wanna have all as many tracker bars as you want out, you could pick up your jigging rod, one of your heavier jigging rods, and tie the X-Wrap on, tie the Nomad on, and fish it right off of a spinning rod. No problem. So that gets you one extra bonus rod in the spread. And just like the shooting Ron Z, if for some reason that day it's a really slow day, you'll just get that one random fish and that eats the, the diver and saves the day. And then on top of it, you get to fight it on a spinning rod. Now getting into the on the water part, what to do when. This is kind of over the past two and three seasons, this is a blend, a simplification of what we've seen. Starts off with the bluefin showing up, just running out, finding where they are. And the past three years, when they first show up, getting them on the jig, it's been hard. They, they're up high, they're just getting into an area. The bait isn't really settled in deep there. It's really a troll game when it first starts off, when we first find them. And you might see them on top, every once in a while passing through. They're finicky, they're hard to get, but that's when trolling is uh, really what I stick to. And then once they get in, they hold to an area, that's when you can stop trolling and start jigging. They get settled in into this one area, you'll start marking them, get into it more, but that's kind of the next progression. Then once the bluefin are holding in that area, the yellowfin start showing up. If I were to give a rough date for each one, Bluefin arrive is usually sometime second half of June. They settle in after a couple weeks of being there and then the elephant join in sometime in August. Rough timelines. Once the elephant are there, that's when the popper can get really good. They, the bluefin are there, they've been there, they're home. Then the elephant come in and they, they're competing for the same bait. So they both start like going crazy. So that's when they'll come up, smash anything they see and the jig bite is really good too. Then late season, it's been different every year. One year we were running way west to get on a yellowfin chunk bite behind draggers. Last year we had the chunk bite right close to home. And then other years there's these fish that come in inshore even last year and there's a top water, bluefin top water bite. And other years there's nothing here after one good storm pushes them all off, but Cape Cod has fish. So it's always a question of what to do then. So early season, running out and looking for the life. Finding the whales, finding the dolphins, finding the birds, that's really gonna tell you where the fish are gonna show up first. If you're running, you find the life and 
they aren't quite there yet, they will be eventually, most of the time. There's been times where there's been an area of life and then 20 miles away where there's only one whale to fish show up. You're like, doesn't make any sense, but talking for most of the time, that's really what you wanna find is the whales, the birds, and the life. Um, so this, getting into the basic trolling spread, like I said, tracker bars are kind of my main thing that I rely on. If I were to have, I would call it a four or five rod minimum if I'm covering water quick and just want to throw things out, maybe two tracker bars, but really to do it, four rods is what I would call the minimum. Dark color tracker bar and a bright color tracker bar, just two different things. I love purple and black. I love green, I love zucchini, and I love white. If I, were to have, if I had six rods, a purple, green or zucchini, and then a white on the inside. Just stagger them, just like in that picture there. And then that ballyhoo and, I mean, saying ballyhoo, the, shoot in Ron Z or the Ballyhoo if you have bait. Go straight down the middle way back there. You throw in a daisy chain in the middle and that's kind of, keep it basic, tracker bars, tie a diver on your spinning rod if you wanna add something else. If you wanna throw the shoot and Ron Z out, do it, but I'm confident just running the tracker bars, a diver, throw one more thing in there. And, What's the third from the left? This one? Yeah. That would be your diver. That, okay. that stays the shortest basically right in the wash almost, um, especially in the canyons. I, I keep it really close, but Mitch or just let it out. Uh, with Power Pro Depth Hunter, that's what I run on all my reels, has, has the marks every 25 feet, maybe let it out 100 feet, if that, 75 feet, three colors, and comes to a big advantage when jigging to having the mark colors. But that's, yeah, that would be your diver, bars, chain, shoot. That's basically it. You hook into say you hook into one on your what side, uh, what side or starboard side fire tracker bar. Are you clearing your spread before you bring that thing in? Or are you trying to leave some lines out? Clear the ones closest to it so it's not going to screw everything up. But actually leave some lines out while you're trying to bring it up. Right. So when I first get a bite, say we'll go start off with this guy here. Say he gets eaten, I'm going to keep driving. Well, if anyone gets eaten, I'm gonna keep driving for probably at bare minimum 30 more seconds at the same speed that I got eaten on. If they're in a pack, more are gonna come up, especially if they're yellowfin, they're gonna pile on. Bluefin, more times than not, it'll just be a solo hit. But, well, last year kind of proved that wrong, but they'll, they'll pile on just as much. So if, if you just get a single solo strike, most of the time it's a bluefin, but if they start piling on and it's that time year, I'll assume yellowfin, but when the bite gets crazy, Bluefin will pile on too, but yeah, keep driving for 30 seconds, a minute, depending on how much line is taking. If it's smaller fish, you can go a minute. If it's a big fish really taking line, 30 seconds. And then, yeah, clear this side first. If I could let, leave those out, if it's not that big of a fish, I will. Um, some bars sink more than others. That's really what it comes down to. I don't want to have them sink. So if I got to actually stop and fight the fish straight up and down, then I'll clear all of them. But say the inner bar gets, eaten and has a risk of getting that, I'll clear this one right away. Yeah. Keep driving a little bit, but clear that one while I'm driving and let those guys stay out. Sure. If it's a back bar, just let them be, try to get as many fish on, take advantage of that opportunity as possible. And then for early season, you'll see fish on top, the bluefin on top a lot. They're, if you see them on top, they're, they could be feeding. A lot of times they're moving, so they're really finicky, not actually feeding. Those come up while they're migrating and as they're trying to find an area, come up out of the surface. So that's when stick baits and paddle tails will really come in, sinking stick baits. Uh, sometimes the big floating stick bait is what they want. Just, they see something big, pisses them off, they come up, eat it. And then the paddle tail works really good when they're finicky too. Getting good casts in front of them, wherever they will be, not where you see them now. If they're going really fast east, get ahead of them east, get a good cast into them, work it through them then. And then as they settle into an area, this is when slowly stop trolling or it'll be a first light troll bite and then that kind of dies off either because of boat pressure or the fish start settling deep and that's when jigging starts. So once the basic coaching that I give when jigging, always, always, always is start on the bottom. I don't care if we're marking them way up high like this or if they're down deep, always hit the bottom. If they're up high and they see it go down, they're gonna follow it to the bottom. Uh, something to think about 
well, in all fishing, this, this counts. Fish are, look for ambush points. Stripers are gonna be hiding behind a rock, on a rip line, behind a hump. Offshore, there's no structure, so there's only two ambush points. The surface and the bottom where they could pin bait. So right here, they have the bait pinned to the bottom. They have bait pinned on the surface too. There's fish feeding on top and down low. So when, when you drop that jig down through them, they could pin it right on the surface or you'll be casting top waters above them where they're feeding. They feed in those two areas. And so always hit the bottom. Like I said, when I start jigging, I'll give, if I have two guys, if I'm with one other person or whatever, 50-50 Ron's metal, Ronzy metal. Just figure out which one they want for that day. Do you ever throw like butterfish out there to keep them around if you get them? So later in the season, I will. Okay. When it's early in the season, it's hard to get them keyed in on bait. What it is with the fall and chunking, someone may know, but I, whatever it is, not, that, not to say the guys haven't got them chunking in July, but chunking, that butterfish thing really starts late in the year, late August, September, October. This is more just chunking, fishing the life. This is all around the life, finding those whales, staying with the whales, and not piling on top of the whales. I'm sure everyone has seen it, guys driving, hammering down right on the whales as soon as they come up. Set up, think logically, if they're feeding this area, you're drifting west, get up above them, drift into them. They don't like all the boat traffic, all the sonars pinging, just kind of be as stealth as possible. Sometimes when you're trolling, you gotta put a bar next to the whales. That, that makes sense, but when you're jigging, set up drifts, think of it logically, instead of just piling around, hopping, 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 trying to drift in there, usually that works more than reeling up, running over. The running gun thing works, obviously, when they're on top, that's, that's what you gotta do, but jigging, a lot of the times, just fishing it conventionally, like you would inshore, just doing drifts. Yes? When you first set up, are you gonna throw out a, a, a Ron Z dead sticking with two active jiggers, or? Yeah, definitely, yep. Or even have someone do the Ron Z in their hand. The Ron Z, if I'm not dead sticking it, so if I don't have a lot of people on the boat, I'll do exactly that, throw it out, then I'll, get it to the bottom, put it in the rod holder, forget about it, then start jigging metal actively. And then if I'm fishing Ronzi actively, same thing, hit the bottom, and then it's just slowly reel. Slowly reel and just hop it up a little. Just less is more with that, I can't emphasize that enough. Guys that don't really do that good on Ronzi, a lot of the time they're working it too much. They're thinking of it like a metal jig. They're working it, working it, working it. That's not really what it was meant to do. It works sometimes, they'll come up and chase it, but a lot of the times less is more. The, when you say the bottom, doing like one crank, so 41 inches up? Um, I'll probably do, I'm trying to think what I would, probably more like five cranks, and also depending on how fast we're drifting, how fast it's gonna scope up. If it's staying right under the boat, I'll try to lift it up probably 10 feet off the bottom. So if there's bait, if we're in 140, the bait's at 130, I want it just above that bait, above bait. sticking out. Yes, exactly, so I would try to get it here, I guess more like 15, 20 feet off the bottom. Yeah, so you wanna create something that looks different from the bait, but still around the bait. Exactly, yep. Where they'll be feeding, instead of just blending in with all of it, try to separate it. And I think that's what the pink comes in for. It looks, just catches their eye, something different. If there's a million sand eels there, what's that pink thing? Let me go figure it out. That's, they, they eat it. And with metal, cadence, there's really no set cadence on it. Hit the bottom and I'll figure it out as the day goes on. Sometimes they want really short, quick, snap, 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 keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. And other days they want slow, have it fall down, lift, catch up a little bit, let it fall. So it's finding that balance of what they want. There's really no set cadence to it. There's a, and once you find that rhythm, just stick with it. So how about colors on the metals? Do you, do you find that affects bite or is it just more the action? Of <laughs> it could be so, like the Ronzi, I'll stick with a natural and a pink, again, unnatural. On this I have, so this is kind of exactly how I would run out. I have a pink and white on this and then a sand eelish one on this one. And just figuring it out. Sometimes it'll be 50-50, sometimes they want one over the other. But same thing, just kind of cover those bases. Don't get crazy into co colors. I mean, there's a million different jig colors. Just have natural and catch their attention colors. And then shifting later in the year, so now we're talking like August, whenever the, you start hearing of yellowfin, seeing and hearing of yellowfin come in, this is when the popper really comes in. For some reason, yellowfin are 
really apt to come up for the popper, and I think it has to do with the competition of the bluefin and yellowfin being there. Bluefin found their home, they were eating there all fine for a month, and now all of a sudden yellowfin come in and <coughs> making it hard to eat. When you see these streaks like this, this is usually telltale sign of yellowfin. That's kind of, you see that, you're like, all right, there's the elephant here. And sizing down on the jig bite, bless you. And I'll size down usually 170 to 210 grams for these. These are the Shimano Shimmer Falls. They're just standard, the, my narrow jigs, that's my go-to narrow jig. And this is a 170, this is, um, these are both 170s, but then 210 is one size up from that I'll go with. What were you using prior? For, you said size down, like what were you, what size were you? So 170 and 210 are my standards. Yeah. Those are my go-tos. And then I'll even drop down to 140 or even 100 gram for yellowfin. And same thing with the leader. I'll st 80 is my standard. If I'm marking those streaks, I know that there's yellowfin in the area and I'm not getting bites, I'll drop down to 60, 50, 40. On the jig even? Yes, okay. yep, definitely, yeah. More so on the jig than top water. Yeah. Um, top water, Leader shy, if I'm fishing the paddle tails and the singing stick baits, yes. Um, size down leader a little bit, but for the most part, on poppers especially, leader isn't really in the, in the picture just because there's so much commotion and they, they're so keyed in on it and all the bubbles and everything, it's not really in their eye versus a jig where you're working it right past their face it becomes more of a problem. Same thing with the Ronzi, I'll drop down leader for it, um, 60, 50, 40 until I, I get a bite. And then these are the standard 10 inch Ronzi's. I'll drop down to an eight inch. The eight inch still has the swivel hook on them. This is huge. Make sure you, when going out there, you have the swivel hook on it. These are the HDs, the medium heavy duties, have the straight hook. You could run into problems with them. It probably would hold up on a yellowfin, but they'll straighten out sometimes or bend, out, bend a little bit. The swivel hook is made for what we're talking about here. And, so these come with, this is how they come rigged. I'm not sure exactly what size hook it is, but this is kind of his fixed head. And that's how it is. You could pass that around too if others want to look at it. So do you have a um, jacket up to like a three, 350 size jig if your current's kind of, you feel like you're getting a little scared <coughs> out on the 200s? Yeah, uh, at the Cape, that I run into that more. When fishing here, I, I never, I don't want to say never, but most of the time that 200 gram covers me. But yeah, if, especially on the Cape, the, the Regal Sword Bite, fishing the bottom there, it's a little deeper, more current. That's when sometimes you'll have to go up to that. But even if it is, I'll pitch the 200 gram. It just seems like that size, that size works so well. I'll pitch it up drift and then by the time it gets me, even if I get to work it twice before I have to reset, I'll do that just to keep that same size profile. So I think that that's around the same size sand eels that they're eating. So just try to keep it as natural as possible. Exactly. Yes. Yep. And then talking about poppers, main thing to do is keep an eye on your popper. Watch how you're working it. On a slick, calm day, you'll really be able to pop, pop it good, get a big explosion, big bubble chamber, and then it, it'll hold to the water fine. And then if it's choppy, if you do that same hard of a pop, it's going to kick out of the water, look totally unnatural, and fish won't like it. So just each day, if it's choppy, you might be able to just do a, slow, a slow sweep or a short sweep. Just keep an eye on it, make sure that it looks natural. And like I said, covering water earlier with the rod length that coming into play. A lot of the times we won't actually have feeding yellowfin when we're fishing midshore, it'll just be around the dolphins, the whales, the birds. You'll just see birds sitting on the surface, casting around those, covering water. Just taking long casts, taking your time, paying attention to each cast, and then they'll come out of nowhere. During the day or during this part of the season, you'll find, all right, well, they're sticking with the dolphins. Let's stick with the dolphins. Nope, they're right on the bubble feeds of the whales. We got to go cast this popper in the bubble feed. Or these birds are following them around. We don't see them, but the birds see them. So let's go chase these guys around. So just paying attention to what they're keying in on and covering water and making sure it looks natural. Just, you see fish breaking on the surface, you're gonna wanna cast and sweep as hard as you could and it's gonna kick out of the water and get tangled and the fish are gonna be like, won't even look at it. So just really paying attention to that. And then as we're fishing the midshore, say the gully, tuna ridge, the dump, there's always the option to run south too, or troll south even. 
that once the yellowfin are coming in from the edge, they're coming in from the canyons and they eventually make it to find the bait where we've been fishing the bluefin. There's always the option if that slows down or if there's a ton of boats there, just start heading south to the lanes. There's just yellowfin, there's no really structure, there's no life out there, there's temp breaks that you could work out there and that's where you'll get a lot of big yellowfin and then kind of saves the day sometimes and working out in the lanes. Are you looking for any behavior from, I mean sometimes you go out there and there's just like endless pods of dolphin. Is there, you know, something that they're doing that says, hey, I want to go after this pack of dolphin? Or yeah. Kind of it, it's tough. If they're around the life that we're fishing, if they're around the whales, if I'm marking bait, if they're in the fishy area that we've been in, I'll definitely pay attention to them. Yeah. But then running in halfway home, you see a pack, they kind of look like they're feeding. Yeah. It's hard to stop them because you said there, there could be so many. And if we're trolling like earlier in the season, just make a pass through them. Sometimes there are fish right up with them. And if you go through them, you might not mark them because they're literally right up with the dolphin. There has been days where I go, I see that, and it's been a slow day. I, I pull up to them, throw the popper right in front of them, and my, <laughs> I'm thinking of this one day, one specific day, it happened, it was a slow day, I had nothing better to do basically, just trying to find something to, to fish. Pull up to the dolphins, my friend's like, really? I'm like, just, just try it. First cast in them, no sign of fish at all. Bluefin came up, ate the popper, and for the rest of the day, called in our friends and we'd fish these dolphins. Save the day, like something I drive past nine times out of 10, but just happened to have fish that day. So yeah, just when to pay attention to them if they're around the life, yes, definitely. If it's a slow day, you're just trying to find one last saving grace, check them out. But if it's good in one area, you know that area is good, just it's, it's hard to pay attention to them. And then late season, this is where, like I explained to you guys earlier, it, it always changes, there's no steady pattern. The bluefin showing up on a troll bite, slowly switching to a jig bite, then the elephant joining in on them on the jig and topwater bite. That's, I could say it's a pattern now. Hopefully I don't jinx it for us this year and none of them show up or none of them happen. Um, but late season has been different. This year was chunking. To tell you the basics about chunking, just like the popper and trolling, light leader, small hook, Make the butterfish, that's what I'm chunking most of the time. Some people do herring, some people can do mackerel, but butterfish is, is the main thing. Um, this is, I think a 6.0 circle hook, light wire, and it's all about making your hook bait look like um, the chunks that are falling that they're eating. So starting off, finding some marks, seeing some fish milling on the surface, they aren't eating the jig. If other people are chunking, it'll turn them onto the chunk. So that's when you gotta stop, ch when you gotta start chunking starting throwing chunks in, chunks in. And my basic setup for that is leader size. I go down from 80, I'll usually start off with 60. I'll do one rod with 60, one rod with 50, one rod with 40. Usually 40 is when, if they don't eat 40, they usually aren't eating, period. 40 is usually the lightest I'll go sometimes, maybe, maybe 30. But I like going with, if, if it's not a wide open chunk bite, sometimes you'll get them right up to you with the chunks, but for a normal chunk bite like we had last year, having to let it go down, 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 I like going like 15 or 20, foot, 20 feet of leader, kind of like jigging, maybe a little shorter than jigging. And I just do a small spro swivel in there, just tie it. Um, for lighter stuff like that, I don't like crimping, 60 pound, 50 pound, I don't like crimping. And this is where the 25 comes in, having that 80 pound, it goes down through the water nice instead of 100. 100 or even 130 catching it and most of the time I'll just slowly f let them out with the chunks instead of putting them out on balloons I'll just put one rod in the front one rod in the back and just let them go down with the chunks start one wait a little let the next one go and start with that and this is when I fell in love with this rod being able to chunk with this put in the rod holder with the terminator but fix like this let it go let it go one takes it, jam it up, put it to straight, just fight a fish like you're on a jigging or casting rod. They're great trolling, great chunking. I, I really fell in love with them last season. And getting the chunk looking like, getting your hook bait looking like the chunks is really the most important part. You'll start slowly marking them as they come into your chunk slick. You'll see them, all right, one's at 60. Oh, he's back at 40. He's coming up, coming up. Getting that to look as natural as possible some people, I've done it before, get a little piece of styrofoam, put it in the butterfish to offset the weight of the hook. You can get as technical as that. 
but most of the time with a light wire hook, if we're just doing you know, 40, 50 pound yellowfin, the hook will hold up fine. The 60 and 15 pound leader will hold up fine. And that's once you get them there, the main thing is to keep them there. So even if you do hook a fish, have someone set on throwing the chunks in. Just keep feeding them chunks, keep feeding them chunks, but don't overfeed them. There's a fine balance. You kind of just eyeball it. Just don't throw buckets full in because they'll not even want to look at your hook bait if you do that. But keep them interested enough, especially while hooking a fish. Have like one guy set to that. And then other options, if the chunk bite isn't there, that's we got lucky last year and two years ago there was the, the other yellowfin bite out west. Um, cape is usually good late season. That's kind of my saving grace if this dies off. Um, that goes all the way until November most years. So going up, either bringing the boat there or hopping on with someone else there, usually good top water all the way through November. Sometimes November is the best month. And then last year, right off the vineyard, we had a good top water bite. This is, that's what this picture was. There were balls of pogies that the fish had piled up. They were, the pogies were moving out and the bluefin were, found them. How, I don't know. Right, right off the island and they were just ripping through them. So we had good top water there. That was October uh, after that chunk bite fizzled out. So it was a good last push of the season for us down here. And then if you got the mid shore thing down and you have the weather and the capability to go to the canyons, that's similar concepts, but on a larger scale, I would say, instead of fishing the life, you're looking at water temp charts and water clarity uh, chlorophyll charts. This is what the chlorophyll charts are. It basically tells you just how blue the water is, the chlorophyll in the water. Um, this is heavy and then this is the blue water that you want to fish here. Finding the differences in that, so right on this line here would be a temp break and a chlorophyll break a lot of the times. One comes with the other, but if you have, and by like August, September, a lot of the water could just be hot. So finding what water's different, the blue water, that tells you what to fish in the canyons more times than not. And the canyons are cool because you kind of nail all different things. You have the tuna trolling in the morning. During that, you could pick up a blue marlin, white marlin, wahoo, big eye tuna, you won't see those inshore. And then the yellowfin and longfin albacore, kind of a wild card trolling in the morning. Then you could either keep trolling all day and I switched to deep dropping, deep dropping, I fell in love with one after the first time I did it. It's totally different and more technical than uh, a lot of the things that we do just because how deep we're fishing and how sophisticated it is. You have no idea, you can't mark them down there. You're just kind of basing it off of structure, the spots that you're fishing and letting out. We're fishing shallowest 1,400, 1,500 feet of water on the bottom where they live during the day and going from there and hoping that it works and it works. But every time you do it, you're like, really this? And then if you wanna see the swordfish thing, that's really, really cool. Something totally different than, than the tuna. It's amazing to see how and how evolved it's gotten daytime. A lot of times it was just nighttime doing the chunk and live bait at night when they actually came up to feed. But during the day, they're, they're living on the bottom. They want no part of the, their eyes are like so big, they really sensitive to light. So they stay on the bottom in the dark there and something that a lot of people overlook here how good that actually is for us it's is when we get the weather windows it's one of the most consistent bites that we have and then the mahi we get those mid shore in the summer smaller chickens and stuff but in the canyons hitting the pots right on the edge you could really get big ones that one was 30 pounds we found a floating poly ball that day that was that was the early season that was june and every mahi on it was like that it was like 30 pounds for some reason I don't know if they followed it all the way up from the stream, wherever it came from in the stream, but it was incredible. But getting those mahi are like a big bonus um, you know out there. When you're dropping that Mo yeah, a big majority of the time I will, unless someone specifically wants to hand crank. I've done the hand cranking thing. It just, it's not efficient for the amount of times, kind of like this, I try to make it as efficient and simple as possible. The hand crank, getting it, that just the time, if you don't get a fish, to get it up to the surface, you, you basically lose one or two whole drifts during the day compared to using an electric. Fighting a fish on it is fun. Um, I use Beastmasters, so Shimano Beastmasters, they have the handle option if you want to pick it up and fight stand up. I mean, the fight and any fishing is fun, but the whole concept of dropping that deep, seeing how subtle the bite is, the bite is literally, for a 300 pound swordfish, this will be the rod with the weight on, it'll be this. Then I'll go back to bouncing. Then I'll be this. 
then eventually you have, you have a 10 pound weight on it. It feels the weight before you pull up on it, so it starts swimming up at you. Totally different than any other fight. It's swimming, the, it's fighting the weight coming up, coming up, coming up, and then eventually sees the light around, say 300 feet of water, and then it'll start fighting the other way. So you just basically keep up with it, let it swim up for as long as possible, and then once it sees the light and starts fighting, then you gotta fight it reverse. Just actually start fighting on it. While it still has the 10 pound weight on it, and it, the thing starts jumping out of the water, the line is going down like this because it has the weight on it, but the fish is 500 yards out on the surface over there jumping, it's like, it's crazy. It's it's so cool to see. You break that, does that weight break off? Are you bringing that in? No. Nope. Yeah. Bring it in and, hook, and uh, unhooking it. Yep. So it's if watching. It's not the most during while doing it. It's not the most exciting fishing. I'll be blunt about that. You're watching the rod tip. That's all you're watching. It's bouncing like this in the waves. Then all of a sudden you see the bite. The slack up. All right, we got one. Then it's like, oh my God, it worked. There's no way. <laughs> and then it swims the weight up, swims the weight up, and then you fight it, starts jumping. It's, it's cool. It's totally different than what we do for our midshore fishing, but that's, it's, it's special to me. So you're not using temp and chlorophyll charts midshore or no? Um, I'm more focusing on the life. If there's life in an area, it could be the dirtiest, greenest, cold water, and the fish will be there because because that's the only bait around. The whales, the dolphins, the birds, they're gonna go where the bait is, and that's that's what the fish want too. Early season, if there's a pocket of warm water, like if I'm running on no reports early season, going out, I'll focus on that just as a starting area. All right, do I run west or do I run east? Do I run straight down? Um, that'll kind of give me an area, if a little bit of warm water is trickling in, I'll, I'll go with that. But for midshore, most of the time, um, mainly just focusing on finding the life. I'll, I'll just early season run, 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 run till I, I find something. And just which direction you run, you might not see anything. So it's a, it's a gamble, but once you find them, you're, it's all worth it. Um, so just things to touch on. I'm sure all of you have heard of the giant bluefin we've had the past couple of years. It's like, we're so lucky to have that fishery and it's how close it's been getting and how accessible they are. It's incredible and the size of the fish. I mean, every year we were getting them over 800, no problem. Some close to a thousand. It's, it's in the, there you're right off the beach. Everyone knows it now, it's, it's no secret. I know as, I assume most of you guys just have your rec permits. You can keep your rec bluefin and it's tempting to go do it. Again, not telling you to do something or not to do something, just like safety, but they are really enforcing, especially after the past couple of years, having, making sure each person fishing there has the right licenses and having the right safety gear and being 100% legit. So dabbling into that, putting a live bait out in that fleet, or even if you're, you're offshore or at the close bite, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble just by doing that. They're handing out fines. I mean, five figure fines just for fishing for them if you don't have the right licenses. Guys from New York weren't coming over. It's a, it's a huge gray area if you don't look into it. And once you know what you need to have, you know, but it, it's, there's no set list. You need this, 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 and this. And it's hard to get all that set up. So just going out and fishing for them could land you in a bunch of trouble. Go with someone that has the stuff or is doing those trips to experience it. It's, it's a big cycle. I think right now we're getting close to the peak of it, say. It keeps getting better each year. I think at the, at the end of each year, I keep saying this can't get better, but more fish just keep showing up and how good North Carolina is right now, where a lot of these fish go to, it, it, it's basically lining up to be even better than last year. So eat but 10, 15, 20 years ago, what everyone, well, 20 years ago, what people tell me happened back then, um, they, there was like none around, couldn't find them. So, get in on it, like you should experience it, you should see it, it's kind of crazy. We're using 10 pound bluefish, putting them out on balloons and they're coming up smashing them out of the water. So it's definitely something I, everyone should see while they're here, while you're staring at the beach right here where you striper fish, it's really incredible. But to go do it on your own, it could land yourself in trouble. Just keep that in mind if, if you wanna do it, either really pay attention or if you don't wanna risk it, I, I wouldn't either. So. That's one thing to keep in mind. And then fighting fish, um, fighting them on jig and pop is 
conventional gear, you have the winding power, you have the rod to lift them. Some guys will really get stuck on a fish. These 50, you know, 50 pound yellow fin, 50 inch blue fin, six, even a 60 inch blue fin, really shouldn't be that hard of a fight on your gear. I would say a 50 inch blue fin should average, shouldn't take you over 15 minutes max, like 10 minutes, even five minutes on the right gear. It should be taking you, not saying others, obviously sometimes you get a demon, but really having the right gear and fighting it correctly. One huge advantage I could tell you that watching people is have the rod do the work. These rods with the Spiral X and High Power X in them, they're made to lift. And so keeping it never, well, not never, but always try to keep it above a 45 degree angle, 45 degree angle and above. I know high sticking is kind of like a no-no in all cases of fishing, but these rods get the power in the rod when loading them. So having it at that 45 loads them perfectly. When people get tired and they start going like this, leaning on the gunnel, you, you have no lift on the fish. That fish has you beat tremendously. Like that fish is just relaxing, gaining its breath while the rod isn't doing it and you're not doing anything. Keeping it at this, leaning back and having the rod load it, even these rods I'm so confident in, I'm not advising you to high stick it at zero degrees, but keeping it up high, letting the rod do the lifting. A lot of the times with the rod lifting and just a little bit of swell we have, you don't have to do those big lifts and reel down anymore. Big lifts and reel down. The reels have so much torque in them. Um, Twin Power, Stella, they have what we call Infinity Drive. It's basically increased torque in the reel. So the days of to just to get a crank, having to lift up and reel down to get a crank, those days are over. They have so much torque that you're able to get a good turn of the handle while under heavy load. So keeping the rod like that, letting it lift, timing it with the waves, reeling down, lifting a little bit, timing with the waves, reeling down, and the rod will, you'll notice the rod, if you just hold it like this, it'll lift, 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 then you can get that turn, lift, 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 turn, and just having the right gear set up for that if you're finding yourself getting really beat up on, you know, our normal size fish, it really comes down to the gear and keeping the rod and yourself in a good position. And also, instead of burning your arms out, putting it into the core of your body, that picture there, I'm just, that was a big bloof and that was around 80 inches and took a while, that was like an hour. So just after an hour, your, your arms are shot if that's what you're using all the time, but putting it into the core of your body where you'll not burn out as easily instead of your arms, it, it'll benefit you a lot. And then when getting a fish, just basic things to do to keep it nice. Obviously bring ice, that's without being said, for the most part, you see people not bring ice. You're like, all right, you, you put in no effort. But getting it on deck, I like gutting them, cutting the gill plate off. I don't like going up the belly on a, on a tuna like a lot of people want traditional fish. I cut the gill rakers out of the fish with a serrated knife. Just pop the gill rakers out. Um, and then all the guts basically come out at once and you just stuff that with ice, get it in there. Then when cutting a fish up, um, the best way that we found for keeping it in the fridge, I don't like freezing it personally, but you do get a fish, you get, you cut it up, keep it in chunks as big as possible. I know limited to a fridge or whatever, keep it as wide as you could. People a lot of times cut it up into what they call steaks and stake it up and cut it, cut it, throw them into a Ziploc bag. And it's gonna make the fish age and essentially rot is quicker than, because you're exposing as much of it to air as possible. You wanna do the opposite. Keep it whole as possible, give as little, um, little, little of it to the air as possible, keep the skin on it, and then wrap it in paper towel. That's huge, totally changes the fish. If you just stake it up, eat it that day, wrap it up in paper towel, and um, it really peaks around, like depending on the size of the fish, three to seven days after you catch it, if you keep up with the paper towels. Keep changing the paper towels twice in the first day, then once each day, you'll notice a huge difference in how long you can keep it in the fridge without having to freeze it, and how like the quality of it helps a lot. Yeah, yep, exactly. Yep, that's, I'll do that for like the first day, let, let like all the exposed yeah, bloods, and then after that, paper towel, Ziploc bag, airtight, just mm -hmm. keep changing them. It, it's amazing, like I'll do, um, if I get a good like 65 inch bluefin, you can do up to two weeks with it, basically, if you if you keep up with it, 10, 14 days. So you gotta keep changing the paper towel. Oh yeah, every day, yes. Yep, and you'll see all the stuff coming out of it. You'll be amazed, uh, 
like the fresh is best thing that the day of it doesn't get better than this it, it actually does because that stuff that you're getting in the paper towel the blood the water out of it it's what you're eating and that's like the fishy taste say it doesn't taste that fishy but you'll notice that all that coming out of it it's like that much better and um I have a friend that's crazy into it, so that's kind of where I got it from. And he explained to me, he's like a mad scientist, that all the, I forget the exact term, but micro tendons say that hold the muscle together, that's what the meat, all the meat is muscle, breaks down over time too. So it gets even softer and just more tender. It's kind of crazy. He, he opened my eyes to it. I used to just be like, oh, whatever, just go do your thing. Green paper. Oh, from uh, like rice paper, I think they call it. It's a, it's a green paper that they use at, um Houses. Okay, yeah, find, yeah, yeah. It's kind of hard to find, but you can wrap it with that. It's better than paper towels because you don't have to worry about the paper towel actually sticking to the tube. Right, right. That's a good call. It's kind of, yeah. Absorbs. Yeah, you gotta find this one. Yep. And then what you guys have for big conceptual questions, we want to go over what kind of the offshore woes, what is in the back of your head that giving you that little bit of lack of confidence that you just aren't sure in anything like that you guys want to talk about like i know it changes based off the sun yeah the sun, i i want to get i want to get there i want to depending on boat speed obviously it changes i want to get there either for for when the sun rises or before when the sun or before the sun rises so like in june you're leaving it like it, depending on how far we're running yes yep and if boat pressure affects that too if there's more boats on it, the bike's gonna shut off earlier. So get there, try to get there in the dark and fish pre-dawn, dawn, and then if it shuts out, if it shuts off, you were there for it, you got your fish, you're good, and then either call it an early day or try to find something different. Do you have night vision camera or just radar? Just radar, okay. yeah. Um, I know some people that have FLIR, and um, I just, I have so much confidence in my radar, and Point Judith is kind of straightforward is, you know, you got a couple cans in the wall and then after that you're in the clear. And FLIR, it's good, it's really good. It, it picks up pots and stuff, but I'm, I, have, I, I have trust in my radar enough to not jump for that. I know, <laughs> ran through it all. What drag settings are you typically running with 65 pounds? So, <laughs> this is always a tough question. I've never owned a drag scale, just to be blunt about it. So I, everything is just off of hand, yeah. I've, even for my, my big rods for giant fishing, I, just by hand, I wish I could tell you an exact number. I, I would say 15 to 20, 65, really what, it, it the amount of drag that you'll feel, like, whoa, yep. it'll, 65 pound is still good. You won't, you won't run into a problem breaking it. Yeah, I wish I can give you an exact number to set it at, but I've really just all done it by hand, yeah. Well, time for a <laughs> yeah, on the water, and then by the time I, during the fight, up it, up it, yeah, I started off lighter. Yeah, on the talic, it's, you know, the spinning rods is a challenge. Exactly, yes, yep. But then, yeah, I always start off lighter, and then as the fish gets settled into it, I'll add more drag, add more drag, and basically just want to keep lifting him as a, at a steady pace if I could. Your, your yeah, yep. For especially for the bigger fish, once they start running out, I'm not going to up the drag on it. Then just let him do its thing, let him tire himself out. Adding the drag on it does help, but also don't want to pop it if it hits its tail or something. That's really what the the long leader comes into. For a top water, you could run no leader essentially, especially for a popper. Uh, you, you don't need a leader, they won't see it, but that's really for the abrasion resistance. If it's tail, if it gets tail wrapped or if it's tail hits it while running, the floor is gonna eat it up a lot better than the braid would. So say you're, um, say you're throwing like a deep sultress or antidote on one of your casting rods mm -hmm. and you do hook into above a hundred inch fish. You don't wanna lose that freaking hundred dollar, two hundred and twenty dollar lure. Yeah. Pop those hooks by palming that or? Not the hooks, not good hooks, not the hooks that you'd want to be running. So then you either have to weigh out losing that 120, 100, whatever dollar lure, or wasting four hours for potentially maybe getting a lure back, but realistically breaking the fish off four hours after. Exactly. Yeah. That's, it's really, it's made it hard to, not hard, but it's, it's a challenge that we run into, especially with jigs and stuff. 
I have people on the boat that they hook a good fish, it's a big fish, it's a giant. I'm like, it's a closed day, we can't keep them, or the quota shut down, I can't keep them. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you do? You try to get it? I mean, everyone wants to see a fish that big, or but you risk losing half the day to do that. Exactly. So I go with the put the drag up. If he wants to come up, he comes up. If you lose it, you lose it. Because everyone, it's happened to everyone. When you, you make that decision, though. Like, if it's already at maybe 100 feet, then you're probably like, okay, this is, I can keep that fish. But if it's like staying at the bottom, like, how would you start to say, crank the drag down? We're gonna if, drag. if a fish runs. When we hook it, if it runs up on the surface, that's usually a good, a pretty consistent sign that that's a giant mm -hmm. or a really large wreck bluefin. The 70 inches will do it, but that's kind of my first sign. If, it, if a fish takes off on the surface, just piles away on the surface, I'm like, all right, we got, might be in trouble here. Then just depending on how quick it settles, if it, if it settles down deep pretty good, I'll give it time, give it time if you start lifting it. If it feels movable, give it time, but if it's one of those hundred inches that people have been hooking on Ronzi's and jigs, it's just screaming up you know, yeah, and it's, there's nothing you can do about it. And it's, it's, you never want to pop a fish off intentionally. It's like, it's against everything that we know, but at the same time, you lose half your day of one of the few days that you get. Someone was telling me that they can, you can pop the, uh, the, uh, little Diablos. Like Possibly. I bet depending on how it's hooked, yeah, if you have it hooked in a weird way where it will, definitely. And then there's other times where they, they might not wanna. Yeah. Any questions on gear? Rods, reels, line, leader? Did you bring a harpoon? I, I always have two on the boat, yeah, because I, I can keep giants. I, I do that probably I, almost 50% of the time. Well, if it's like a 65 inch fish, are you harpooning it? If it's on the right gear now, if it's, say it's like a 65 or 70 inch fish on 40 pound fluoro on, chun on chunking, and I've been fighting it for a while and it's possibly frayed and getting that last gaff shaft will be a problem. Yeah, I, I, I definitely consider harpooning it. Yep. I never, uh, I've even, yeah, big yellowfin. We had like a hundred something pound yellowfin. Same thing, chunking, light leader. Fought it for forever and I didn't want to lose it. Harpooning a yellowfin kind of seems like really, but. <laughs> It was the one bite that we got that day on light leader. It was freight, really frayed up by the time we got it. So just safety net, just put the pride to the side and just get the fish for whatever cost necessary. When you're, when you're out there and you run across a tailing white marlin. Yeah, to yeah. To, to get them to bite. I mean, I've got them like, you know, coming right up to the boat, looking at you when you're <laughs> the lure, but yeah. you get them to commit. I, follow. Right. What, what, did, what were you throwing at them? Uh, like, like a Ronzi or something. Yeah. So I, I know it's, it's hard. If they're actively feeding, usually kind of like the striped marlin that we were talking about, yeah. they'll, they'll eat. Yeah. But if they're finicky, usually the stick baits are more what they'll tend to eating. Any of the stick, uh, sinking stick baits. Probably a little slower. Yeah. Until they get on it. And then as they're on it, just like the striped marlin we were talking about earlier, kick up to get it away from, get it away from just like teasing them, yep. then eventually they'll commit. But yeah, stick baits is kind of my go-to. I've, I've hooked them on the popper in the canyons. That was kind of, wouldn't be my go-to, but that was one that was feeding hot on it and just came up and ate it, saw it. But yeah, white marlin are, they, they come in mid-shore. That's another thing um, that comes consistent. I should have put that in mid-season too, kind of in August. They'll, they'll come in, you'll see them on the surface finning, and they're a huge bonus to get. Have your same popping setups with a stick bait or even a popper paddle tail. Cast it, get, make a good cast at them, hook them, they jump all over the place. It's, it's a good bonus to have for the day. You see half beaks coming out. It's usually what, what the Marlins are on. The same, same, same bait, same approach. Just tease them with it and see what they get. Exactly. Yeah. They're they're feeding. Well, sometimes they'll just be milling up there, just kind of cruising around. That's that's when they're hard to get to eat. That's when something small or a paddle, small paddle tail or stick bait. That's when they'll do it. But if if they're up chasing bait, you see them slashing and everything. That's when put a cast near it, and it and you'll be good. Yeah, yeah. 
So this is my go-to setup, obviously size down, but this is across the board casting and jigging for braid to fluoro, FG knot. There's tons of videos online to learn it. It's, once you get confidence in it, won't need another knot. Other options are the wind-on leaders, having a fixed loop in your braid and then loop-to-loop -loop connection for your wind on. But I found I have the most confidence in an FG and the most doable instead of having packs of wind-on leaders is having a spool of fluoro. And then for lure to leader or jig to leader, swivel split ring. This gives it, it won't twist your line up if it's a spinning lure and the split ring kind of takes the line off of the lure and then easily interchangeable without having to retie every time. I'll do this for stick baits, jigs, but I won't do it for Ronzi. Ronzi, I'm always tying direct. Ronzi has the swivel built in already and just one extra thing to have on that head that the fish could see. Just always, always, always tying direct to Ronzi. I, I think that makes a difference. It's one. Straight yes, yep, that swivel built in is super strong. Just tie right to it, it's one less thing for them to see. And Yeah, so I'm most most of the time doing polymer. If I'm in a rush or I don't have that much leader left, I, I you can get away with an improved, simple inc improved clinch knot. Seems basic, but it's strong, yeah. Yep, but most of the time when setting up, I, uh, I'll do polymer knot. You turn direct to the hook for the junk too? Yes, yep, exactly. Trying direct to the hook for the chunk, just less things for them to see. Yeah, and then are you, um, I don't know, shoot Ronzi? No, I'm thinking for the chunk, um, when you tie it with the hook, uh, oh, floss. Are you, are you, no, to a snow snow it? Snow no, it. I think you shape on the snow. Or? Yeah, just polymer, just polymer. Sa same deal, yeah. That's, that's usually, <laughs> that's, that's usually the philosophy with a circle hook, but, like you said, chafing, chafing it up on the base of the hook, yeah. just a little closer to the, too close to the mouth for comfort. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some people have done it and gotten away with it, but just simple polymer. Now, would you ever put like shrink wrap on that? Like if you say you're going out and you're setting your gear up the night before, put like a shrink wrap tube on the, like if you're setting it up a chunk thing, you're going out in the morning. For chafe protection? Yeah, on the chunk bait. Um, no, I, I think it's just one more thing for them to see. I, I try to bury the hook as best as possible in the butterfish. I'll run the hook for my hook bait. I'll, I'll most of the time always use the head side of it, cut it in half or even a whole one sometimes, but I'll run it into the mouth of it and bury it in the bottom. So it's just barely, just this part is sticking out of its belly. And then if it's good where I'm just feeding it out, no problem, I'll just not floss it up or anything, but if, you could tie, if you're gonna put it out on a balloon or just for extra security if it's rough out or something, I'll floss it in, use floss and a rigging needle, tie the hook in, so run the floss through the eye of the hook, mm -hmm. through its mouth, down through the top of its head, mm -hmm. tie it like that, and that'll just keep it secure there. Okay. And that's an offset? Um, yes, yep. Um, Mutu works good, not the Super Mutu. The Super Mutu I find, unless there's big fish around, I find that the the wire's too thick and it makes it fall, uh, sink too, too quick. And the normal Mutu falls good. But anything in that medium gauge wire setup is, uh, is good. And watch, just watch it. If you gotta drop down, I've, I've even used bass hooks. If I run out of hooks, drop down to bass hooks with 40 pound, you aren't putting a ton of drag on them. So that's, uh, that's kind of my. And when they're dialed in on the chunk, have you been successful at all jigging? Or um, so take last year, for example, it was early morning, first pre-dawn, first light jig. They were coming up for the jig. Then I don't know if it was a light thing or the chunks starting to be thrown in the water more that switched them, but that's when I couldn't buy, couldn't buy a bite on the jig. But then in other years when, say not, not that bite specifically, I have been able to pick away some, some bites on the jig. Yeah, I, I didn't know if it was, you know. That I stayed with the leader, you know, I had 60 on there, maybe I should have gone down to 40 or something, but I mean, there was lots of fish around. Oh, a ton. They wouldn't, you know, jig, jig all day. Right, right, and just chunks. Yeah. Yep, and then that bite, one thing to keep in mind um, that I didn't know that um, an older, someone who fished, been around chunks a ton back in the day, that bite went on for four days. There was a four day weather window, ton of people there at the three days ton of people and the last day was kind of crappy weather but there's still maybe 20 of us there 
And then a big storm came in and everyone ran back to it after that to think the fish were still gonna be there, gone. When they were holding there all year, they were basically there for two months, two or three months in the same general area. What happens is the fish get keyed in on those chunks. They forget about the sand eels and the chunks become their main forage. They think that that's the natural forage in the area. And then when that storm came for those two days that shut it down, oh crap, the bait left. There's no bait here. Even though there were still sand eels, they were so keyed in on those chunks. Like we gotta go find new bait and totally gone, ghost town. So that's one thing I never thought about that someone explained to me last year. Yeah. We cut them open and it's just stuck with chunks. chunks.